Hello again, wonderful people. I am Justin Ribeiro. I'm going to talk about deploying all the things using Google Cloud Platform. Slides are right here. I'm sure we'll post the link later if you want to view them later. Uh, this is some, you know, relevant information about me. I am that guy with the, you know, thing. Uh, I am a Google developer expert in wearables. Uh, I'm on the trusted testers uh, for Cloud Platform. Uh, you can find me doing a whole bunch of stuff on the web when I'm not doing Android and other things uh, and all over the cloud. So what are we going to talk about this evening? Uh, we're going to talk about the big overview of Google Cloud Platform to start with because there are some misconceptions that a lot of people come to Google Platform with, uh, which we're going to talk about. Then we're going to talk about containers, oh, the containers, we're out there, oh, Docker. Uh, because Docker is really cool, uh, and it's going to make deploying RethinkDB a lot easier on Google Cloud Platform. Of which, we're going to talk about deploying some RethinkDB on Google Cloud Platform. So for the past 15 years or so, Google has been building this massively, hor uh, just horribly large, powerful, high-quality infrastructure. Um, we use it primarily most of the time when we're searching on Google. But as developers, we can use it to do a whole bunch of really awesome things that make our apps, applications run at scale very, very fast. So a lot of people have the misconception that Google Cloud Platform is only App Engine. So a lot of people say, well, App Engine is the only piece, and it's this one little cog amongst many, um, because App Engine was the first to sort of come out. So we all remember App Engine when it came out. It was this sort of different way of thinking about how to make things for scale. Um, it was very much the App Engine way. And a lot of people sort of take that misconception and say, well, that's how all of Google Cloud Platform is. I do not have the flexibility to deploy what I want, which is not true. Um, so the Google Cloud Platform is actually fairly deep in terms of what you actually have. You have things like Container Engine and Compute Engine. Uh, you have on the storage side things like GCS, which is Google Cloud Storage, the SQL, you have the Data Store, which if you've ever used stuff on App Engine, you've probably used the Data Store. And then you have the big app services, your Cloud Endpoints. If you're on the Android side, you probably use Cloud Endpoint, very nice feature. Uh, and then you have BigQuery, when you need to really process all that data. And there are some newcomers to this, you know, this sort of tooling that we have, including Kubernetes, which is orchestration for containers, which we're going to talk about containers. It is fantastic. And then Firebase, the real-time API for all the things on the client side, uh, which is now a part of Google. So how do all these services from a my agility to my flexibility sort of outlay? And when we talk about these things, we talk about how we deploy them, what kind of run times we're on, or am I bringing my own, am I developing my own mystical snowflake architecture of things? Um, because when we're talking about cloud infrastructure and even on-prem gear, for those of you who still remember what on-premises gear was, <laughs> um, so much of it was this stuff that you used to rack and it was hard and you had to install the thing and there was a patch and you missed the patch and then things would go poof. Um, so on the Google Cloud side of things, you end up with this App Engine hosting environment, which has a very customized runtime, which gives you the, a huge amount of agility in terms of the amount of scalability you automatically get. And then on the other side of things, you've got the VM world, right, where you have all the things you would normally have on our VM infrastructure that you would want, your own optional packages. Hell, you could run your own web server if you like. And you get the flexibility of being able to define your own stack. And from this, you know, in a, in, a, in a little clearer slide, you end up with this VM, which is your basic atom. It'll run anything you want. And then you end up with this collection of things, clusters that you can deploy to. Manage collections of code. It's declarative. It's dynamic. It's very awesome. It's kind of in the middle of things. And then you got the platform as a service stuff, which is what you would end up with your curated services, like App Engine has, um, your rich services, your auto everything. So if you've ever done scaling on App Engine, you know that it'll scale to your heart's content. You don't have to understand what a load balancer is or how round robin DNS works or any of those things. So App Engine, simple to scale, easy to develop, trivial to manage. Um, the trivial to manage portion of it is really the really nice thing about App Engine, as a matter of fact, um, is that it's really fully managed. You don't have to worry about that stack. Um, and then the problem with App Engine that a lot of people ran into was you had to think the App Engine way, which was you had this very minimal runtime that you had to use. You couldn't bring your own packages to it. Uh, and then so in beta now is App Engine Managed VMs, which gives you the flexibility and productivity of App Engine 
on top of a stack of VMs, which gives you this really cool option to bring your own dependencies and your own runtime via Docker containers, which is really cool, which we're going to talk a little bit about. Um, but the newer side of life on the managed VM side is that you get load balancing, scaling, you get at cloud SDK integration. So if you're coming off of App Engine or you're looking to deploy something within the stack, but it doesn't really fit in App Engine, you can use custom runtimes to deal with some of those problems. So this is the, you can look at the slide later on when you look at the, uh, you know, when you get the slides on your desktop du jour. But on the App Engine side, you have a very limited sort of, you know, this, again, this little tiny world view of what you can ship on against it. On the managed VM side, you get a significantly amount, more amount of power. Whether you need that power is entirely up to you. You get to decide how you want to push those limits. Uh, custom runtimes are also in beta right now. So this is the ability to simply change your app.yaml and uh, define a Docker file which will load a particular image. Uh, so the Docker file defines your base. Uh, the app.yaml, if you really build stuff on top of App Engine, is sort of where you define your running environment. Uh, and then optionally, you can always respond to health and lifecycle checks. So this slide is uh, happiness when all this is working quite well. So you end up with an app, a Docker file, G Cloud app run, G Cloud app deploy, and you've deployed and pulled from the registry. The registry gets tossed into the container within your VM, and now you have your custom setup running. Um, so this is the newer side of life on the managed VM sides, but you can also do this with just pure VMs, with, 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 with what is called a container VM. So Compute Engine, uh, so Compute Engine, you can think of, um, if you've ever used EC2 or the normal resources that we'd have on other cloud platform providers, it is that sort of thing. Um, there are some differences, um, primarily in the cost-effective region of things. Um, you do get sub-hour billing, which if you run really heavy workloads can save you quite a bit of money um, from a development standpoint. We run renderers on Google Cloud Platform for some of our animation department stuff at the office, and um, sub-hour billing saves us quite a bit of money, actually. Um, the other thing that is really, really nice that people don't realize is it's consistently fast. And fast VM provisioning is one of those things that a lot of people say, well, what's fast? And you can really provision some VMs on Google Cloud very, very quickly, five to 10 seconds. They're always aiming to be faster. But if you've ever had that instance where you've just tried to fire up a VM somewhere and it takes forever and a day and you just want to go home and the VM won't fire so you can deploy the thing, um, Compute Engine is really fast in that regard, and it's really consistent on the performance scale. Um, if you test it in your dev environments, it gets really, really nice, just nice, pure, nice curves. So containers and Docker, not specific to Google Cloud Platform, but it is really awesome because what in the world are containers? Containers, processes, microservices, jails, zones. Anyone ever here use Solaris zones? I'm probably the only person ever to <laughs> Solaris Zones. It was from about 10 years ago. Um, it was really cool. Um, but a lot of people who real, never realize they're running jail when they start out in web development, if you've ever deployed something, a lot of times you're in a, uh, a shell jail, right? Uh, just your basic troot, okay? So a container in the Docker world is this little isolated sort of thing that allows you to process whatever you want isolated from a whole bunch of libraries that you may not want to deal with or maybe different version against your set. So you can think of it as just being just nice sandboxed little world. You want that isolation so that you don't conflict with something else, you don't have to deploy against any of your things. You can bring your own environment. Of course you can, it's a little tiny container. Think of it as a cup with a nice tasty drink. All right, you can bring that sort of thing to it at whatever you want. You can define the container to spin up, install, do whatever you need to do within its thing and it doesn't hurt the underlying VM. You don't get the horrible conflict, you don't get any of that stuff. Containers are everywhere. So Google, uh, if, if, if you look at the, the way containers are being used today, Google ships billions of them all the time. Uh, Google's been on container architecture for a long, long time. And uh, one of the things that um, we use it at Stickman, I work at Stickman Ventures, for those who are interested. Um, we use containers all the time for primarily our render farm stuff where we deploy out. Um, and we ship not nearly billions, but we ship quite a few on a daily basis. And containers are really nice because you can fire them up, fire them down, do whatever you want with very little effort. So uh, an introduction to Docker. Docker is very deep. 
uh, and I cannot possibly touch on all the magical things. But I'm going to touch on a few highlights because they'll sort of help us understand how to deploy RethinkDB as we get further down this, this path. So a Docker image, you can think of it as your read-only template. You can think of it as just a little tiny thing that says, I want to create this container some way. It's going to be the image that is going to run your stuff. The registry is this public or a private store that contains a series of images. I might have an Ubuntu image. I might have a CentOS image. I might have something that is simply BusyBox, just running random stuff that I want to run. Um, the hub uh, from Docker is uh, public, rather. Um, App Engine has its own private repository of uh, images that you can use. Um, and you can also define your own images that you, if you wanted to use on Google Cloud Storage that give you access to the fiber backend that is really, really fast. So when you want to deploy that container, you're not waiting forever from some outside endpoint. Uh, you can stay within the infrastructure and it gives you a lot of speed. So a uh, Docker container, the runtime component, okay? The thing that um, can be stopped, moved, deleted, just tossed all the way around, right? This little itty bitty container. And you can have a whole bunch of them or just one. So uh, if we look at this, we're looking at vanilla virtualization, right? We have a guest environment. We have something that's, you know, we have our hypervisor, which is going to run all, you know, our low-level stuff. We've got a guest kernel, some library stuff. Vanilla virtualization. Vagrant, so to speak. I deploy a Vagrant VM, yay for me. Um, the downsides is, is that it's not portable and it's opaque, right? Um, you're locked into that particular platform against that machine image. Um, and that makes sense in certain cases, um, but it can be troublesome when you need to scale out. So what do you do? Um, well, this is what happens. Is that, oh, I'm going to run two apps on the thing, and then I got libraries. That's a dependency on that, and then just conflicts. And just, ah, it's not good, right? We have no isolation, right? We want isolation to sort of make our lives easier as developers. So we need to snip. Uh, we need to snip at the kernel. Uh, or our operating system level and say, hey, let's contain and extract. So we can get a portable isolated environment now. So we can say, hey, containers two, one, two, three, they're running underneath that same hypervisor and on top of a, a particular node kernel, but those containers are completely isolated in their nice little sandboxed world. So Justin, graphs and pretty pictures are all fine and dandy, but by George, can we actually run something? So. Uh, this is a basic Docker command. I'm going to say run dash i dash t busybox. And we can sort of break down what this actually does. It's going to pull the busybox image. So our image is actually right here. Right? Okay. And then we're going to say we're going to create a new container within that thing. We're going to allocate some file system. Uh, we're going to allocate some network to that container. And we're going to ex execute the process uh, specified, which in this case is shell. So, but whoa, what's with the flags? So the flags uh, do a couple different things. So dash t is going to assign a pseudo terminal for us, right? So we can actually interact with that particular container in its little isolated box. Uh, and then dash i is actually going to make that, uh, that terminal interactive. So, yay, standard in. We can do all the things that we normally want. Ah, I'm stuck. How in the world do I get out? Control D or just simply type exit. But Justin, I don't want to run an interactive thing because I'm deploying this, and I, you know, I need to be just, just daemonize the thing. Backgrounds, backgrounds. So you use dash d in that regard, and it'll send the container into the background, a la the daemonize. Uh, and so now we can write a basic hello world on top of BusyBox that says, you know, while true, we're just going to echo hello world, and we're going to sleep for a second, and then we're just going to keep doing that forever and a day. You know, the command doesn't look much different, right? We're simply taking out the I and the T, we're ashing dash D, and it's going to put it into the background. But you're probably wondering, well, wait a second, where in the world does hello world go? So dash D actually does not give us the normal sort of interactive console, right? We've now sent it to the background. What happens is, is dash D is automatically going to throw back to us container ID. And from that container ID, we can use it to do other things that we might want to deal with that container. Primarily, you might want to pull the logs, in which case it's going to pull logs and notice that, oh, I, it's going to pull the standard in logs and say, oh, hello world, just being written out continuously in a loop. Um, you can also do Docker PS, which is going to automatically list all the running sort of containers and processes within them to deal with that. So in this case, you can see the container ID, then you got the command that's actually running when it was created in status. I've snipped a few of the things. There's a, there's a name field that gets auto-generated that you can use as a reference as well. Uh, it didn't quite fit on the slide. 
Uh, so that is the speed round O Docker. I know you all now are thinking, I am an expert in Docker for the love of Pete. Uh, but alas, there is lots, 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 lots more on the Docker front that I cannot simply cover in 20 minutes. <laughs> so I do highly recommend you read the user guide. Um, the user guide is actually really good on the Docker side. It has a lot of actually very good and simple cases to get started with. Uh, and I highly recommend it, even if you decide, uh, you know, Docker's not for you. It's a good, like, precursor into what containers look like for the future. So let's talk about rethink on compute. So how hard is it if we know that rethink will run? Um, we know rethink, you know, like, everyone's deployed rethink, right? We, we've deployed rethink DB. We know that we can go forth and deploy it to pretty much any stack we want. But how do you do that the Google Cloud sort of platform way? And uh, what we can do is actually we can use a compute instance to do a very simple, very quick deploy. Um, I'm not going to talk about the managed VM stuff uh, tonight in terms of that because I haven't fully tested RethinkDB on that. But I have tested RethinkDB on compute, and it works pretty well. So um, what you basically do is that you can use the G Cloud SDK. So the G Cloud SDK is available for pretty much every platform at this point. You can download it, you can run it, you can install, and you can run the commands locally within itself. Um, I did get this question the, the last version of this talk I did, and you can also actually do this through the actual cloud console that Google has for developers, where you would normally get your Google Cloud Project ID stuff. You can actually create a VM instance on there as well and use um, Secure Shell basically through Chrome on that side. So it'll give you a shell window, that it'll give you a standard terminal that you can type into. So if you don't want to deal with setting up the G Cloud SDK, and you don't want to deal with configure set projects sort of things, you can actually fire up the instance uh, and use that instead and do, use these very same commands on that. That said, this takes the approach that we're simply doing this straight off the good old command line. Um, so this first command we're looking at right here is going to define our project. Um, again, you would normally go to the cloud console on the Google side. I'm going to define a project. It's going to give me a project ID. And then I can go forth and do all matter of things, including turn on Google API services, deploy more VMs, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, from there, once we have this Google Cloud AP, uh, Cloud Project ID, rather, um, we can go ahead and create an instance. So creating an instance in Google Cloud is actually not that hard. Um, you can simply say, give me an instance. I'm going to create it. I'm going to give it a name. Uh, I'm going to tell it that I want a container VM. So there are actually a whole bunch of images you can use um, for compute instances. Um, container VM is simply one of them is, that is uh, the easiest one to use when dealing with Docker. It'll let you do containers pretty quick-like. Okay, so we're going to use a container VM image. Uh, we're going to put it in central 1A, and we're going to use the smallest, tiniest one I could find because I don't want to spend a whole bunch of money. Uh, so then we're going to say, hey, great. It's going to sit there, spin up. From there, we can go ahead and say, well, hey, I want to shell into that machine, uh, or rather that instance against the zone and whatever I named it as. And you're thinking, okay, well, that's three. So, okay, well, great. Um, so I've cut a command out of here. Uh, there's actually a command you can do that will save you the, the, the task of actually writing sudo every time. Uh, you can add your user to the, uh, to the group, and then you don't have to be doing sudo all the time. However, in this case, we're going to cut the command out, save ourselves some typing. Uh, so we're going to pull the rethink Docker file. So the RethinkDB uh, image is actually on the Docker registry. Um, you can pull it up on your web browser right now if you want and go through all the registry images that are there. So RethinkDB has one that has a whole bunch of options. So we're going to use the most basic install. I'm not going to talk about clusters or anything of that nature. I'm looking at this more of a I want to develop right now against RethinkDB. And this doesn't take into account also the fact that I might want to lock this down later on. But we pull the image. It's going to spin. It's going to tell you, hey, I'm going to pull this image for you. Great. Uh, I'm going to change my compute firewall rules because by default, uh, 8080 is not open, and we probably want to run our admin console in 8080. So we create a new rule. This rule is going to say, hey, this is my rule's name. I'm going to allow action on TCP 8080. Firewall rules. Spins up. Opens up that port. And then we're going to actually run the container that we pulled. So sudo docker run, we're daemonizing it. Dash p is talking about ports in this case. Um, and then we're going to run the file that we pulled. And then from there, we have some more commands to run. 
No, we don't. That's it. That's all it takes. <laughs> you can deploy out in just about six commands. Um, and you could probably shrink this down a little further too, um, should you script it out. But at that point, your panel that you would normally see for RethinkDB would be running on the host port, the host IP, whatever that IP was assigned to you, which you would see, uh, and then on 8080, and you would see your admin panel. That is really sort of the, the gist of the power of Docker in that regard. Whereas I might have to install an image and oh, well maybe I need a PPA or do I need to go get the file or where's the latest one? The Docker file that RethinkDB uses contains all that information for us. We don't have to worry about those things. We can simply say, go give me this thing and start a container with this instance. And as I said, if you look at the actual registry and see all the options for that container, you can do a whole bunch more with it. You don't have to worry about necessarily all of that when you're doing just development work and you just want to get it up and running. But in the meantime, if you really wanted a more complicated install, you wanted to do that orchestration portion we kind of, I kind of hinted at earlier, um, you could do that, the same thing with that container, using the exact same container you're using for development. And that's really sort of the power where Docker comes in, is that the container you use to develop against, you can use again as you deploy. And you sort of take away that snowflake architecture that you had before. Well, what was developer A running that made that work, but developer B doesn't have? How many of you have done that? I have no idea what that is. Everyone is like, oh my gosh, I had that yesterday. Oh, it was killer. I banged my head against the wall for three hours. Turned out I had a period somewhere in this other thing and it just broke everything. Like, we've all been there. We don't like the snowflake architecture of config files and Docker via containers can help us do that. So hey, dollars oh dollars. You can use, you can use, uh, you can trial all these wonderful commands out of here. Um, there's a $300 trial for new users on cloud.google.com the moment. Um, you can also apply for the $500 starter pack if you've got a startup that uh, there's a little form you can fill out to see if you qualify for it. Uh, and then there's also a couple other sort of things if you want more things to fill out for more credits and whatnot, let me know. Um, there are a couple other startup related sort of credits you can get in, on terms of the Google Cloud side. So I do highly recommend you give it a try if you have not tried Google Cloud Platform before. It's really nice. And it makes really deploying things like RethinkDB and a lot of other container images or Docker images or Docker containers really fast. Um, the speed is amazing. And that is all I have. You're probably saying, oh geez, Justin, that was speedy and quick now. But that is in fact all I have. I will take questions briefly. <laughs> <laughs>